you see to get out your Bibles again. We're only two months away from our Bible conference here, October 18th. Sorry, October 19th, 2021. Uh, it's good to have the uh, full band back this morning. Uh, it's been a while since they've all been together. You could uh, definitely hear the low end with Kurt the Gold in here, okay? He's just he's got that bass, that low end going, so we're glad to have that back, Joel. Um, but we're glad to be here. My wife and I, we just got away for two nights uh, last weekend before school starts. School starts Tuesday, two days from today. It's the earliest I've ever started school in about almost 17 years of teaching now. So it's a little bit, I don't know, I'm, I'm sore too today from helping Brad and Marshy move yesterday. There were some saints from the church that uh, made it out to that. Uh, we had some good times, uh, good, good conversation, even though we were working hard and so forth. But uh, we're glad to be with you this morning. I want to continue our series on 1 Corinthians 16. And as we work our way toward the end here, I only read one verse this morning for the Scripture reading. Let's read verse 12 again, and then we'll have a word of prayer and begin the message. Okay? As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient time. Lord, thanks for this day and for Your Word. We pray that as we look this morning at the issue of decision-making in the Word of God and how we are free under grace to make decisions, decisions based upon truth, based upon Your Word, not based upon feelings, hunches, impressions, and circumstances, that we'll have clarity from your word as we consider this particular topic. We're grateful for this time we can spend together. In Christ's name, amen. Now, two Sundays ago, we looked at verses, uh, we looked at verses 5 through 11, which are dealing with Paul and Timothy's travel plans and their travel itinerary. And we, we flip back and forth a lot of places between the book of Acts, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and a few other spots, trying to piece together what all that meant and, and how all of that developed and so forth, right? Trying to, trying to get that. Well, in doing that, though, we missed a couple things that I think we need to just hover back over just for a minute and get them into our frame of reference before we get into talking about some things as they pertain to verse 12. So as we considered the comings and goings of, of, of uh, Paul and Timothy two weeks ago, okay, we failed to touch upon something that pertains to Paul's decision-making process, how Paul made decisions, how Paul thought about things, where he was going to go, when he was going to go, how and why he was going to go, these sorts of things, okay? And I've always been struck by the fact that Paul did not talk like a Calvinist. Paul did not talk about how everything in his life was a divine providential appointment of God that everything in his life was somehow predetermined and laid out for him in advance. That's not the way Paul talks when he writes his epistles. Paul talks as somebody that has decision-making capacity, somebody that can determine for himself when he's going to go to Corinth, where he's going to tarry for the winter, when he's going to go. And it's not something that's already laid out and pre-described and Paul's just following some sort of, uh, some sort of plan that's already in the cards. The other thing that's always struck me about Paul is, is that he doesn't talk using the verbiage of much of modern evangelical Christianity about God's circumstantial leading and reading the tea leaves and looking at the different things that are going on in his life circumstantially and using those as some sort of a barometer or a measuring stick to determine his relationship with God and what kind of decisions Paul should be making. Paul doesn't do this. Let's look just quick at verse 6. In verse 6 he says, and it may be that I will abide. Now, maybe it'll be that way, maybe it won't. Maybe it won't. Paul's not talking like there's some sort of preordained, pre-planned, pre-described way that he's going to behave. He says, maybe it'll be this way, maybe it won't. Look at verse 7. Halfway through the verse he says, for I will not see you now, <clears throat> uh, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord what? So Paul's not, Paul is not talking like the way a lot of evangelical Christians talk about the subject matter and the topic of the will of God and, uh, and what's going on in his life. Look at verse 8. He says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until when? Who's making that decision? Paul's making that decision. That decision is being made by Paul. 
Paul is, is making it an informed decision based upon what he knows is going on, that he's going to stay at Ephesus until Pentecost, that that's where he's going to tarry. So Paul viewed himself as being free and responsible under grace to make his own decisions. Okay? Paul does not talk like somebody who thought that he that who who, who thought that he needed to, you know, seek the Lord's face and 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 you know read the tea leaves and the circumstances in order to know God's will and to know the, the providential appointed time that he should go to Corinth or any of that sort of thing. Paul doesn't talk like that in his epistles. He doesn't use that theological jargon, that theological speak that so many people do that you encounter out there, okay? And then that brings us to verse 12. And this is where I want to base most of what we're going to talk about this morning on. Look with me at verse 12, okay? It says, <coughs> excuse me, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. Let's stop right there. What was Paul's will for Apollos? What did, how did Paul want Apollos to behave? Paul wanted pa Apollos to go visit who? The Corinthians, right? That was Paul's will. That's what Paul desired. He wanted Apollos to go and visit the saints at Corinth. Look at the next part of the verse. okay? But his will was not to come at this time. So Paul wants Apollos to go where? To go to Corinth, right? Does Apollos want to go to Corinth? Not now. Now, that doesn't mean he's never going to go. That doesn't mean there might not arrive in the future a circumstance where Apollos is going to go to Corinth. But Paul wants him to go to Corinth now, and Apollos, his mind, his will, is that he's not going to what? He's not going to go. The verse says it very plainly. He says, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient what? Now, is, pa is Apollos totally and completely closed down to ever going to Corinth? No. But Apollos was busy. Apollos had something going on. Apollos was already involved in ministry somewhere else. And he said, Paul, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go to Corinth right now. If the opportunity is convenient for me sometime in the future, maybe I'll come. But you see here a thought process. You see here a decision-making process that is playing itself out for you. Okay? Paul's desire or will was that Apollos go to see the Corinthians. Okay? Now, in the short term. That's what verse 12 is saying. Okay? Meanwhile, Apollos' will was not to go to Corinth as of the time that Paul is writing 1 Corinthians. Okay? Now, notice, does Paul try to persuade Apollos against his will? Does Paul say the following? Does Paul pull out the Apostle card? Well, Apollos, I am the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to go where? I want you to go to Corinth. You would not dare defy an Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who has seen the Lord and, 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 and uh, had an experience. You remember I was on the Damascus Road. I saw the Lord, Apollos. Are you going to not follow my instruction? I want you to go where? I want you to go to Corinth, right? Well, Paul is like, that's great, Paul, but I'm doing this, whatever it is, the text doesn't say, but I'm doing this thing over here, and I'm not going to go now. Maybe I'll go in the future if it's convenient, but I'm not going to do that now. So Paul, Paul does not try to persuade Apollos against his will. Paul does not try to play the apostle card on Apollos, okay? And say something like I just said, well, you know, Apollos, God told me, here's another one, right? Well, God told me that He wants you to go where? Uh, Corinth, right? And try to manipulate Apollos into doing it. That's not what Paul does. Paul understands that Apollos has a will, and his will at that time is not to what? It's not to go to Corinth. Maybe he'll come if there's convenient time. Okay. Now, Paul viewed himself then and other believers as being free to make decisions for themselves. Okay? Based upon a renewed mind, functioning with an intelligent understanding of God's Word. Okay? Paul is not behaving the way that many Christians today that we encounter try to behave. Try to think. Try to function. Try to act. Okay? Let's look at some other verses here. Come with me to 1 Corinthians 7. Come over to 1 Corinthians 7. I have a book right here. 
It's called Decision Making and the Will of God. Okay? And what this book does is presents an alternative paradigm for understanding God's will. A lot of, in, in most evangelical Christianity, people will talk about the will of God as that it's this, this nebulous thing that's out here that it's my job to figure it out. I've got to discern it. I've got to figure it out. I've got to, I've got to find that, that dot that's right in the center of God's will. And God has that one, that one perfect preordained person that I'm going to marry and that one job and that one career and that one house and that one this and that one that. And it's my job to, to find it. And if, I'm, and if I'm outside of that, I'm somehow missing out on God's best for me type of a concept, right? So if you, if you listen to any Christian teaching or read any Christian books, you'll, you'll know that this is a very familiar concept, right? And I'm trying to point out to you here that Paul doesn't talk like that. Okay? He does not talk like that. He does not advise the Corinthians to behave like that. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, have Apollos behaving like that or try to force that type of thinking on Apollos. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. The wife is, bo is bound by law. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. Now watch. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she what? Will. Only in the Lord. Ladies, gentlemen, if you're going to get married, whose decision is it about who you're going to marry? It is yours. Okay? It is your decision. It is your choice. You need to choose wisely. Okay? You need to take God's word. You need to evaluate the individual. You need to see where, you know, how are they shaking out as, as uh, so forth as it relates to God's word. And you need to make a decision by faith about these matters, not just based upon feelings. And I know what you're saying. Oh, Pastor, that's so unromantic. How could you say that? What'd the verse say? It says that she's at liberty. What does liberty mean? Freedom. That she is at liberty to be married to whom she what? Notice it doesn't say to whom the Lord predetermined. It does not say to the one that the Lord providentially selected. It doesn't say that. It says whom she what? Whom she will. Now here's the caveat. Only where? So if I'm a young lady, for the sake of illustration, and I'm trying to find a husband, right, I know that I have a parameter. The parameter that I have is, is that this person has to be a believer, right? They have to be in, they have to, they have to know the Lord, right? Hopefully they care about the Lord. Hopefully they want to serve the Lord and that kind of thing, right? But beyond that, is that person at liberty to decide for themselves whether or not they're going to get married? And if so, who they're going to marry? It's their choice. It's their will. It's when, when, when two people get married, they are both exercising their will. Okay? They are both saying and, and, and using and swearing an oath to each other uh, uh, via marriage freely. Okay? Come with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Look with me at verse 25. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. <laughs> In this context, Epaphroditus has been sick and so forth. Look at verse 25. Paul says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. When Paul explains that, how does he talk about that? Does he say there was a divine providential appointment of God that I send you, Epaphroditus? Does, does Paul say God spoke to me in the midnight vision and told me to send you, Epaphroditus? He says what in verse 25? He says, yet I supposed it what? Who made that decision? Paul did. Paul made that decision. Paul made that decision just like Apollos made a decision that was contrary to Paul's will. Okay, In 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 
1 Thessalonians chapter 3. To get the context here, also get chapter 1. Also get chapter 1, get chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul and Sylvanius and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians. Okay? So, so Paul's writing it along with, and he's mentioned two other people. He's mentioning Sylvanius or Silas and also who? And also Timotheus or Timothy, right? Now come to chapter 3, verse 1. Come on to chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, it was a divine providential appointment of God that we should be left at Athens. Is that, is that what he says? No, he doesn't talk like that. He doesn't use that language. That's the language of theology. That's the language of philosophy. That's the language of men who have tried to marry philosophy with theology, frankly, okay? But that's not the way Paul saw it. That's not the way Paul talked about it. He talks about it that they, that he says, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Who's making that decision? Paul is, along with his travel companions. Come to Philemon, verse 15. Come to Philemon, verse 15. Now, while you're finding that, let me just remind you of the story of Philemon. Okay? Philemon had a slave, a servant named Onesimus. Okay? Onesimus ran away. And in the process of running away, he finds Paul and sits under Paul's teaching and gets saved. Okay? And what the book of Philemon is, is, is the Apostle Paul writing to Philemon to explain the situation as it pertained to Onesimus and encourage Philemon to receive Onesimus back. Not, as a, not merely as a servant, but as a brother in Christ. Okay, And that's what this epistle is, is, is about, right? So Paul is writing Philemon after the fact. Onesimus has already run away. Onesimus has already done Philemon wrong and dealt with him not in a, not in a good way, right? And in running away, he encounters Paul, he gets saved, and now Paul is in the process of trying to rectify the relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. Look with me at verse 15. It says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him what? Notice what Paul says. Paul say, I know on the authority of God Almighty by divine providential appointment that Onesimus had to run away, that he was going to get saved, and now I'm going to send him back to you? Or is Paul after the fact saying, perhaps this is the reason why this was? Okay. So come back with me to 1 Corinthians 16. Sometimes in these verses, at the end of these books, you encounter these verses that we tend to just sort of throw away or gloss over because we just think, oh, well, Paul's winding down the epistle. But sometimes there's things that are in these books that are very powerful that we need to think about, that we need to pay attention to. Look at verse 12 again. He says, As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. So again, Paul's will, Paul's desire was for Apollos to do what? Go to Corinth. Okay? But his will, that's Apollos' will, was not at all to come at this time. Now what does Paul say? That jerk Apollos, I hope he never comes because he did me wrong. Is that what he says? No, does he say that Apollos violated the will of God because he refused to listen to the Apostle Paul? No, that's not what he says. He says, but he will come when he shall have what? Convenient time. When the time was right and Apollos was ready, does he leave open the option that Apollos might come? Okay, so if, if this is not the way that these verses to me lay out a different decision-making model and a different way of thinking about the will of God than what a lot of than, than a way a lot of people think about this. Okay. God has never used circum. Now listen to me. God has never used circumstances as a means of divine communication. Never. Okay. The only way you know that you have received a message from God is through an objective standard outside of yourself. Okay? Understand, if that's not the case, 
then can anybody come along and tell you any old thing that they want to tell you that you should do? Now let me show you this. Even in Israel's program, come to Romans chapter 2, even in Israel's program, you say, well, God, God dealt with Israel through outward circumstances. And the answer is yes. But those circumstances in and of themselves didn't tell Israel anything about, about God. God's Word had already told them what those circumstances meant before they occurred. And the authority in Israel never was the circumstances. It never was the outward things happening out here. It was always a written standard and a written authority of God's Word to the nation of Israel. Look with me at Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Paul talks about Israel, the Jews here, and he says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Okay? And watch this now. And knowest His will. How did Israel know the will of God? Because they went out here, and, Oh God, what are you trying to tell me out here? How did Israel know the will of God? They did not know the will of God by going out here externally and reading the circumstances. Read the rest of the verse. And knowest His will, and approvest the things that are more excellent. How? Being instructed out of the what? The law. How did Israel know the will of God? They, know, they knew the will of God through God's written word to the nation of Israel. That's how they knew the will of God. That's how they were, that's how they approved things that were more excellent. That's how they made their boast of God, because they had God's word. Okay? Now, this is Israel, the signed people. We already know from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, that the Jews required what? Did God deal with Israel through outward circumstance? He did, right? But that outward circumstance was not the barometer. It was not the thermostat. It was not the measuring stick to determine what God was doing or not doing. It was always what? His Word. God's Word to Israel. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11. <coughs> Come to Deuteronomy chapter 11. So I don't know if your situation this summer has been anything like mine and my wife's. But it seems like a daily conversation, is it going to rain today? It's dry, right? It's been dry. I was talking to somebody recently, can't remember who it was, talking about how when, the, when it's dry, the corn points straight up or something like this, and when it's, when it's not dry, it like hangs over, I don't know, whatever. But the point is, it's dry, right? So, what should, how should we take this? Should we be sitting, at, sitting here looking at this current environmental circumstance and saying, Hmm, I wonder if we've done something wrong. I wonder if God's mad at us. I wonder if this, I wonder if that. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, look at verse 16. <laughs> Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, that ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And He shut up heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless she perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Now let me ask you a question. If Israel is out here in time past, and they see famine and crop failure and no rain, what does that tell them? Are they just like, geez, God, what are you trying to tell us? Or is there a verse right there that tells them what it means? It tells them what it means. It tells them that they depart. Look at verse 16 again. Take heed unto yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve what? Other gods and worship them. If they break the first commandment and go a whoring after other gods, as it were, are they going to see no rain? Are they going to see crop failure? And are their enemies going to eat the fruit of their hands? Okay? This is what he says, right? So when they're sitting there and they're seeing no rain and crop failure and they're oppressed by their enemies, are they scratching their heads saying, Lord, what are you trying to tell us? No, because he already told them what it meant. He told them what it meant where? Right there. Right? Come with me to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Now some of you have heard me talk about this before. It's been at least two years, I checked. 
Some of you have never heard what I'm saying before, and you're going to be sitting there thinking, oh, this is strange. This isn't, any, this isn't like anything I've ever heard about this before. That's the point, right? Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all nations. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt, thou be in the, blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kin, and of the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall be thou when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord, uh, the Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee, to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. Right? So is there blessing for keeping the law? Yes. Okay? So when they, have, when they have plenty and rain and bountifulness, bountiful harvest and protection from enemies and, and all these sorts of things, they're not sitting there saying, oh, what does this mean? Those verses tell them what that means. Those cir God tells them what those circumstances meant. He did not just leave it to them to be like, hmm, I wonder what God's trying to tell us. He tells them what He means right here. Now, the, there's the other side of this. Drop down to verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou shalt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these what? Curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Curse shall thou be in the field. Curse shall be thy field. Curse shall be the basket in thy store. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, and the increase of the kin and the flocks of thy sheep. Curse shall thou be when thou comest in, and curse shalt thou be when thou goest out. And the Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that thou settest thy hand unto, for to do until thou be destroyed. Whoa. Is God messing around here? So when the Amorites or the Amalekites or, the, or, or whatever other Canaanite group of people comes in to oppress Israel and so forth, what should that tell them? That should tell them that they've broken God's what? Law. That they have not followed God's Word. That they have not done what God said. But the circumstance of the oppression was not what told them that. It was His Word that told them what that meant. So they weren't out here being like, oh, geez, I wonder what all this means. No, He told them already what it meant. Okay? Come to Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13, <coughs> verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Okay? Did the Jews require a sign? Okay. Now watch verse 2. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. So this isn't some faker. This isn't some dude that's just going to like roll up and sell him some snake oil or something like that, right? This is a guy, this is a prophet, this is a dreamer of dreams that actually works a legitimate sign or what? Wonder. Okay? Read the rest of the verse. Verse 2. And sign of the wonder come to pass. Now watch. Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So, this guy rolls into town, and he does a sign or a wonder to get their what? Attention. So now he's got their attention. And then he uses the attention now that he's gotten by the sign or the wonder, the circumstantial thing, right? And he says, I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to go follow Baal. Right? So he's using the circumstance he's get, to get their attention, and then he says, let's go over here and do this thing God didn't tell us what to do. What are they supposed to follow? Are they supposed to follow the sign or the wonder or the circumstance, or are they supposed to follow God's Word? Read, the rest, read verse 3. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So here's my point. Even in Israel's program, even in time past when the Jews required a sign 
And it was, leg it was legitimate dealings with the nation of Israel for that thing to happen. The circumstantial stuff still was not the, the measuring stick. It still was not the thermostat, the barometer, to determine whether or not what God's will was because God's word had already said what his will was. If some dude shows up and works a sign or a wonder and tells you to break the first commandment and go after other gods, what do you do? Do you follow the circumstance or do you follow God's word? Okay? So it was never the circumstance. It was always what? It was always the Scripture. It was always God's Word to Israel. Which, by the way, means it's really important that God preserve His Word. Okay? Because if God doesn't preserve His Word, and you don't have access to what God said, how do you know that you're doing what God said? Okay? Now, many, come with me to the book of Judges. Now, let me just be honest with you for a minute. In my late teens, early 20s, I thought about these matters in a very sort of what I would call traditional way. Okay, I was trying to figure out and read the circumstances and, and, and all this sort of thing about to figure out what God's will for me was and all this sort of thing, because that's what I was being told to do. And I was confused. And I was maybe not always making very good decisions because I was confused. And then I encountered some teaching that was different on the will of God, similar to what I'm sharing with you today, that liberated my mind on these things and caused me to realize that, you know, as a young person, honestly, as a young person, one of the first places that you encounter this, when you're, especially when you're at Bible college and stuff like that, is as on the topic of marriage. Okay? Right? And so, you know, I'm with my wife because I changed my thinking on this. If I had not, I'm telling you right now, I would be somewhere else doing something different right now, and I would not be where I am now. And I'm very glad that I changed my mind. Okay? Because in doing all this hoodly do, I was I was confused and I, I didn't know what was going on. Judges chapter six. Yes, you can laugh. Ha ha ha. Many people want to function like God the way Gideon functioned like God. Okay? Lord, I want that car. If it's your will for me to have that car, give me a sign. Lord, I want that job. If it's your will for me to have that job and not this other job, Give me a what? Give me a sign. Lord, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to marry this person. If it's your will, I don't want to be out of your will. I want to do, I want to be right in the center of your will. Okay, I want the one right person that you've providentially chosen for me. If it's this person, please reveal it to me. Give me a sign. Okay? How many thought like that? Don't raise your hand. That's the way I was thinking. Okay? Especially if you're sitting next to your spouse, don't raise it. Judges chapter 6. Let's, let's actually look at Gideon here. Okay? Judges chapter 6, look at verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Time out. Stop right there. Why are the children of Israel delivered into the hand of the Midianites? Because they did evil in the sight of the Lord, right? So when old Gideon's standing there saying, why am I being oppressed by the Midianites? Where should he have gone for the answer? The Word. If he went to the Word, would the Word have told him why he's being oppressed by the Midianites? The reason they're being oppressed by the Midianites is because they didn't follow what God was. What God said, right? Verse 2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was that when Israel that when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east even came up against them. And they encamped themselves, and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, 
till thou, till thou come unto Gaza and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. What's happening here? Why is Israel, why is Israel living like a bunch of animals in the mountains in hiding and not able to eat the fruit of their own labor? We already read the answer to that question in this sermon, right? The answer is what? They weren't keeping the law. They weren't doing what God said. They weren't following God's word to Israel. Okay? Verse 5. For they came up, uh, for the, for they came up with uh, their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered the land destroying it. Okay? Now, for the sake of time here, for the sake of time, drop down to verse... Um, well, it's not really dropping down. Verse 6. <laughs> Sorry. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord had sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. Okay? And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. Okay? But ye have what? So why are they in the circumstance? They didn't obey His voice. Where did they know His voice? Where did they hear His voice? Where was His voice available? Right here. Okay? Verse, verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the oak, which was in Oprah, and, for, and uh, sorry, that pertained unto Joash, the Esbianite, Eb, Eb, I guess, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. So here's Gideon threshing wheat and, and doing it in secret and in hiding from the Midianites. Why? Because if the Midianites saw him do it, would they come down and take it? Okay? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Okay? And the Lord looked, and the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? What does God say to Gideon? Listen, Gideon, I'm going to use you, and I'm going to deliver Israel from who? From the Midianites. Okay? Verse 5, verse 15, excuse me. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am least in my father's house. So Gideon says, I, got no, I, don't, have the, I don't have the wherewithal. I don't, have the finance, I don't have the economic resources, right? I don't have the following. I'm the youngest son of my father. Nobody's going to what? Nobody's going to listen to me. Okay? Verse 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, if, Now watch Gideon. If I now have found favor in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou wilt. What does Gideon ask for? It's not. Now Gideon, as an Israelite, living under the law, within his right to request a sign, to, to, to substantiate the fact that this is the angel of the Lord, and he's giving him accurate, correct information. Okay? So verse 18. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my presence. Okay? had said it before thee, and he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephod of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot and brought it unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put 
Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the eleven cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his what? Now, if Gideon is a man operating by faith, did he have what was required right then and right there to know that that was the angel of the Lord and that God was going to do what he said he would do with Gideon? Yes. Did he do the sign? Yep. I come to the end. Verse 36. Some other stuff happens here. We, for the sake of time, go to verse 36. And Gideon said unto the Lord, If thou wilt save my hand as thou hast what? Folks, did Gideon already know what God said? Did Gideon already have the sign commemorating the authentic nature of what God said to him? Yes or no? Yes. So now he's going to ask for another what? Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and be dry upon the earthly side, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand as thou hast said. Now let me ask you a question here. When Gideon does this, is he operating by faith in what God had already said to him? No. He's operating on the basis of a circumstantial approach. God already told him what he told him. He already said, this is what I'm going to do. He already worked the sign. He touched the rock with the staff. It burnt the stuff that he put, the offering that he put on the rock. And the angel of the Lord goes up into heaven. And now here's Gideon asking for another what? Sign. Okay? Luckily, God's patient with him. Verse 38. And it was, and it was so. For he rose up early in, on the morrow and thrust the, and thrust the fleece together and wringed out the dew of the fleece, a bowl full of what? Water. Water. Verse 39, And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry upon the fleece. Let, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. So now, by the time you get to this point, now is he asking him for a, for a third sign. They already know what God said. Did he already have the required sign in the first encounter to authenticate that God would do what he said he would do through Gideon? So when Gideon is doing this, is Gideon operating by faith in God's Word when he's functioning this way? Or is he operating out of doubt and out of his own, I don't know, his own, his, his own thinking about what's going on? Okay, you could say that. But the point is, is that when Gideon does this and Gideon is fleecing the Lord here and trying to get the, you know, just the absolute perfect type of confirmation that, that Gideon wants to know that God's going to do what he said he was going to do, Gideon is not operating by faith. Gideon is asking God to do more for him than what God has already done. See that? When it comes to the issue of decision making and the will of God, we must realize. That, now, listen to me. God's will is not first focused on me. That would be Brian's will. We're talking about God's will. Right? Knowing God's will is first not focused on me, it's focused on who? God. Whose will do I want to know? I want to know God's will. So, if I, now just think it through with me, if I could find out what God's doing, and I could go do that, would I be doing God's will? If I could find out what God's doing and just go do that, would I be doing God's will? Okay? If you want to do the will of God, it's simply a matter of finding out what God is doing. So, what is God doing today? Is God wringing out fleeces? Is God oppressing us by the hands of the Midianites? Folks, we are, we are not Israel. We are not under the law. We are under what? Thank God we're not under the law, or we'd be seeing no... Then you could look outside and say, oh, geez. 
We better do what? We better repent. We better confess. We better get right with God because the reason it's not raining and the reason there's crop failure and the reason there's tragedy and calamity and all this stuff is because we've violated God's law. But through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and through the revelation of the mystery committed to the Apostle Paul, we now know and understand that we're not under the law. We're under what? Grace. God's not dealing with us on the basis of that law anymore. He's dealing with us on the basis of His grace. That ought to revolutionally change the way you think of God's will. Okay? God's will is now not this thing that i got to grope around in the dark out here to try to maybe, hopefully, one day find and have huge you know, anxiety and all this sort of thing because oh, I just never know if I'm right in the center of His will. No, God has already revealed the mystery of His will. Go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> verse 9. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Before I read that verse, let me just, I want to say one thing that I have here to say. If you want to find out, if you find out what God's doing and you do that, you'll be doing the will of God. Okay? So what's God doing today? The thing that God is doing today is He's forming the church of the body of Christ. That's what He's doing. Today, God is in the business of reconciling Jew and Gentile equally in one body by the cross. That's what he's doing. He's, not, he's in the business of, of, of saving people by grace through faith. He's in the business of, of establishing believers to walk on the basis of grace and faith. That's what he's in the process of doing. So if I want to do the will of God, I just find out what God's doing, and if I go do that, am I doing the will of God? All the rest of it is... now. My understanding of God's Word and, and the basis of a renewed mind and stuff, should that help me think through the process of how to make a wise decision about who I want to marry? Should that help me think through and make a wise decision about where I'm going to go to school, what my career should be, where I should live, and how I can serve the Lord? Okay? But it's not this thing that, oh, God's going to zap me one day and boom, I'm just going to know because I got that right thing that happened. No, that's not what it is. It's right here. Look at verse 9. Ephesians 1 9, having made known unto us the what? The mystery of his what? Do you understand that whatever the secret will of God was in time past, he's now what? He's now revealed it. He's not hiding anything back. There's nothing out there for you to search out and find. There's something that he's already made known and revealed and wants you to know and understand it. Okay. Having made known what is the mystery of His will according to His... Now watch. According to His good pleasure, which He purposed where? Whose idea was it to do it this way? It was God's. And you know what? It thrills Him to do it that way. But then we come along with our philosophy and our theology, and we gum it all up. Oh. What does God want here? No, no, no. Get in the Word and find out. Because He's already made known the mystery of what? Go to chapter 2. He's already made known the mystery of His will. What's He doing today? He's forming the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye, are sometimes, uh, ye who are sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's the Gentiles. For He is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, here it is, for to make in Himself of twain. How many is that? Two. One new man, so making what? Peace. And that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that are not. What is God doing today in the world? The thing God is doing today in the world is He is forming the church, the body of Christ, on the basis of the shed blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know God's will, there it is. It's right there. 
No question, no doubt, no groping around in the dark trying to find it. It's right there. Well, pastor, what about the way I should live? Well, I'm glad, yes, go to chapter 4. Verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk out worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Is there a walk now, now that you're saved, now that you're a member of the body of Christ, is there a walk that you're to have as a believer? No doubt, no question. J drop down to verse. Ah, uh, boy, boy, boy. We could get the whole chapter here, but drop down to verse uh, 24. And that ye put on the new what? The new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away lying. What's God's will for you? God's will for you, God's will for me is to put away what? Lying. To put away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one another. Be angry and sin not. What's God's will for you? What's God's will for me? What's God's will for us? That if you're going to get angry, and you will, some of you think I'm angry right now. I'm just fired up, okay? That, if you, that when you're angry, you sin what? Not. That tells me it's not a sin to get what? Now how you use that anger could result in what? Sin. Did Jesus get angry? Okay. Verse, uh, verse uh, 27, Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. You know, it's God's will for you not to steal. Now look at we've just got stealing, lying, we've got all these things here, right? God's will for you and I is to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. No doubt, no question, He tells you what it is. Write these verses down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3-5. through 5. The will of God is that you, that you abstain... Nah, I can't even quote it right now. I'm too excited to quote the verse. Verse 3, for it is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from what? Fornication. No question. What's God's will? God's will is for you as a believer to, to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. It, i got to be careful what I say because Christian young people are out here, Lord, show me your will. Meanwhile, they're hopping out, in and out of bed with four people. What's his will? That you abstain from what? Fornication. No doubt, no question. Does it say it right there in black and white? Okay. So what you see here is that what you end up doing is you end up asking God, oh, please, God, do something for me that you're not doing for that guy. Make me feel more special than that guy. And what God's saying on the basis of grace and in His Word is, look, it, I've taken this body of Christ deal, and I've tempered this thing together the way it's pleased me, and I'm going to deal with all of you, the whole lot of you, on the basis of grace. So guess what that means? That means there might be something that somebody else does or says or behaves or whatever that you don't like, that you don't appreciate, that you're going to have to deal with them on the basis of what? Okay. Write down 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Let me just say something, okay? If you and I would take seriously the will of God that is already revealed in His Word, you'll have enough to occupy your time and intention from now till the rapture. You don't need anything else. You don't need further information. You don't need further enlightenment. You don't need anything else that He hasn't already given you and equipped you with right here on the pages of His Word for life and service for Him. Okay? Circumstances. i got to wrap this up. Still got a whole bunch of stuff here, but circumstances are the context 
Circumstances are the stage upon which we live our lives. Okay? And we are to act upon that stage on the basis of God's written word and His revealed will that is stated clearly where? In His word. Folks, I'm just going to say this right now, and I'm going to say this unapologetically. I believe that that book is complete. I believe that that book is preserved. And I believe we need to be very weary and wary of, of, of any thought process that will come along that will leave us with the idea, the thought, the impression, the inkling that God has somehow held something away from us and that we need more. He's already blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's already sent His Son to die on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again. <clears throat> He's already accepted you and beloved, justified you. He's already redeemed you. He's already done all of these things for you. The idea that you need something else from Him is completely foreign to the Pauline Revelation. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 16 I'll wrap this up. I do have more here, but we don't have time. Get 1 Corinthians 16 to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 16. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 16, verse 12. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. But his will was not at all to what? To come at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient what? Convenient time. What's Apollos doing? Why, does it, why didn't he want to go? I know. I know. Because he's got season tickets to the Cubs. Right? Because he's got season tickets to Michigan and he's just going to be out too late, too late on those home games and he's just not going to make it to church the next day. Right? Why, why is Apollos not going to come? Because he's off doing something else? Or because he's off doing other ministry. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. Look at verse 5. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But what? Minister. Why doesn't Paul, why doesn't Apollos want to go to Corinth? Because he's off doing ministry somewhere else. Is Paul going to, and Paul's not going to say, well, you know, Apollos, I just really don't think you thought about this right. It's a divine providential will of God. God told me, He showed me in a vision. He, he told me last night when I was eating my pizza that He wants you to go to Corinth. And if you don't listen to what I'm going to tell you as an apostle of the Lord, then you're going to be out of the will of God. Is that what Paul said? Nope. Paul could appreciate that as a minister, Apollos was doing ministry over there, wherever that was. And in doing ministry over there, in doing that ministry, he realized that he couldn't come and help, that maybe he couldn't come to Corinth when Paul wanted him to go. And so he's leaving it up to his own mind and to Apollos' own mind to decide how to best use their time. Doesn't Paul say something in Ephesians about redeeming the what? The time? So Paul made decisions based upon a renewed mind. Considering the objective facts of the Word of God and applying them to his present circumstances as he deemed fit. So in conclusion... Man, I'm telling you right now, I am so glad I'm not under the law. I'm so glad I'm not Israel. I'm so glad Romans 5.1 is in my Bible. Therefore, being justified by faith, I have peace with God. When something bad happens to me, I don't view that as God trying to get me, trying to teach me, trying to do anything, because the issue, His issue with me was already settled at the cross 
And it took the shedding of some blood to deal with that issue. And that's already done. Okay? So therefore, we're free. We're competent based upon our understanding of who we are in Christ, based upon our understanding that we live in the dispensation of grace, and with a renewed mind to make decisions for ourselves. You know, freedom is good, but inherent within freedom is the ability to misuse freedom. If you, don't have an, if you don't have inherent in freedom and liberty the ability to misuse it, then you don't really have liberty and freedom. So what, what, God is, what, what God wants to see from you and I is how are we going to use our liberty, how are we going to use our freedom to best serve Him? Not because He's got a big club up there that He's going to whack you with it every time you don't do what He wants you to do. And let me just end with this. I've said that three times, so you can laugh. God needs His ambassadors in every community, on every job site, and in every place of occupation. Ministry for the Lord is not just standing up here and teaching the saints. Ministry for the Lord is you going into your life, going into your family, going into your community, going on to your job, and living there in the details of your life based upon the revealed truth of God's written Word. That's what the ministry is. That's an aspect of the ministry. <coughs> so, if you'll just find out what God's doing, do that, guess what you'll be doing? You'll be doing the will of God. I hope that helps you. I hope that frees you. I remember the first time I heard anything like that, man, I about wanted to jump out of my seat. Because I thought, finally, somebody has said something to me that gives me liberty. It doesn't have me, mm, what am I supposed to do? And never knowing for sure. He's already revealed the mystery of His will. Find out what it is, and by faith do that. Lord, thanks for this day and for the time we can spend together in Your Word. <coughs> we do pray that as a potentially different view of this matter has been shared this morning, that we would not just immediately dismiss it if it's different from the way that we've thought about these things in the past, that we would consider it, that we'd study it out. And that we would appreciate the liberty that grace has given us. And that we'll take that liberty and not use that liberty as an occasion to the flesh, as Paul says, but to, by love, serve one another. We're grateful for this opportunity that we can spend today in your word with these saints. We ask this in Christ's name.